Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Parthenon Virtual Symposium. We are so honored to be streaming to you live from the Parthenon Museum. We are here in the We Have a Vision exhibit. It's about Nashville women from the centennial to suffrage. So that's approximately 1897 to 1920. Tonight, we have a fantastic speaker lined up for you. Her name is Dr. Carol Busey. She's the Davidson County historian, plus a professor at Ball State and advised on this exhibit. So tonight, she's coming to you live from the Parthenon Museum from the exhibit she advised on. And we're so honored and thrilled that you're joining us and that Carol is joining us. Um, a couple, couple quick little housekeeping details. Um, we are going to be welcoming questions at the end of the symposium. So you are welcome to use the chat feature at the bottom end of your screen. And we will be taking those questions and answering them at the end of the symposium tonight. Um, if you have any issues throughout the symposium, let us know in the chat feature as well, as well and we'll be working to solve any technical issues that arise. So without further ado, we are very excited to welcome Dr. Carol Pusey. Good evening to all of you. I'm delighted to be here with you tonight and to be in this lovely exhibit of clothing that belonged to Kate Kirkman, the chair of the Centennial Women's Committee and a really important person in Nashville women's history. I love coming to the Parthenon and I really do believe that as long as I live, there will be two experiences that stand up in my mind when I have come to the Parthenon for an occasion or for something that was going on. And so tonight I have brought a few pictures along to share with you and I will be look forward to taking your questions uh, in a little while. There were actually two centennials in Nashville. The first one was in 1880, celebrating a hundred years of Nashville being a city or a, a place, I guess I should say, rather than a city. It was the hundredth year of the founding of Nashville and it opened down on Broadway. The exposition grounds were at the corner of Broadway and 8th Avenue. It opened on April 24th because that was the day that the John Donaldson party arrived in Nashville and stepped off of the flatboats. And a week or two later, the Cumberland Compact was founded. So that centennial actually uh, was an all male affair. There were parades, there were everything under the sun going on at that centennial exposition. And it was, it was quite an affair. There was a pavilion. What it wanted to showcase in 1880 was the progress that Nashville had made. Uh, there was a large Union Army contingency marching in that parade along with other uh, groups, fraternal organizations, bands, you name it. They were all marching in that. And what this really represented was Nashville as a New South city. Nashville was not going to be locked into the lost cause, at least not yet. Nashville wanted to be seen as a progressive Southern city. African Americans from Fisk were represented well in the parade. The Jubilee Singers sang on opening day. It was quite a thing, but it was all male. So 17 years later, we have another exposition and it is the one that we are going to talk about tonight. Now I have two memories of coming here. Well, actually I really have three. I came here as a child. I grew up in Texas and my parents 
and our family came through here during the Christmas holidays one year going to North Carolina to visit some relatives. And I saw the Christmas exhibit that the Harvey's department store family had uh, produced and had here in front of the Parthenon for many years. And I do remember that quite well. But then fast forward to 1990. My daughter was in third grade and she had to do some kind of Nashville history exhibit. And so when I read in the paper that Alan LaCroix's magnificent statue of Athena was going to be unveiled on a Sunday afternoon, Athena, the goddess, a woman of wisdom. I brought my daughter over here with her little camera we took pictures and it was the most spectacular thing that she had ever seen. Certainly when the big outside metal doors of the Parthenon opened and very, very gradually, this magnificent statue comes into view and there is a moment of silence and then a collective, oh, it was quite a sight to behold. I will never forget that moment, and I don't really think my daughter will ever forget that either. Now, my second or third memory of coming to the Parthenon is a much more recent one. It was on August the 18th, and quite a day that was. There was to be a rededication of the suffrage monument, which is not very far out into the lawn from where I'm sitting tonight in the Kirkman exhibit. And what a beautiful day for a celebration it was. There was a team of female skydivers. A small airplane circled around above the Parthenon in spirals. It did this for a minute or two, and then one by one, a team of women jumped out of the plane with these magnificent yellow parachutes. It was quite a spectacular. One at a time, they came down. They spiraled as they came down lower and lower to the ground in front of the Parthenon. It was like watching ballet. Their feet began to move when they were about 20 feet above the ground. And then as they came closer and closer, when their feet hit the ground, they merely walked off. I'd never really witnessed anything quite like that. And on such a magnificent day for a celebration of a hundred years of women voting, I was really taken with a great deal of emotion to see that spectacle as well. Now let's go back to 1897. How many of you have walked by this monument in Centennial Park before? If you've ever walked in Centennial Park, I bet you've seen this monument because you walk by it. But the other question is, how many of you really know what it's about? Well, it's a col column with a big ball on it, a child might say. This is the monument to the woman's building at the Centennial Exposition. It was erected in 1904, presumably by the women themselves who had managed the woman's building here at the Centennial. It was put in the location of that building in what was becoming Centennial Park. And it has some rather interesting statements on it. If you look closely at it, you see two things that are somewhat, mm, I don't know, maybe, maybe enigmatic would be the right word for this. I'm not quite sure how to describe what it says, but one of these is an aphorism that says this, that that is round can be no rounder. What could that mean? That that is round can be no rounder. Yes, that is a perfect sphere on top of this obelisk, but what could that mean about the woman's building? Where did that idea come from? What was going on when the women chose that to put on this monument? 
below that, you saw a list of the names of the women who had been the officers of the board of women directors of this uh, uh, woman's committee of the Centennial. Their names were there. Their work was magnificent. It had drawn a great crowd during that uh, run of the Centennial Exposition in 1897. Finally, below all of that are the two words, woman's work. What could that be about? The women worked to put up this building. Women wanted their work to be remembered. And below it was this quote from none other than Kate Kirkman herself, whose dress is right behind me. What is woman's work? Now she didn't say that, I'm asking that question. Underneath the two words, woman's work, whatever may be necessary to preserve the sanctity of the home and ensure freedom of the state. The sanctity of the home and freedom of the state. And yet very few people have looked at this. And I did find out that the statement that that is no round can be no rounder had been published in 1895 in a book called Slips of Speech by John Bechtel. And it was kind of cut out of that uh, a speech or that that book of aphorisms it says when a thing is round or square it can't be rounder or squarer that which is round can be no rounder had the work of these women and the significance of the woman's building itself been beyond comparison to be so perfect that it could not be compared to anything else. So let's go back to 1897 and what is going on in Nashville, Tennessee in 1897. Well, quite a lot actually. Now, expositions were not a new thing. We had been having expositions. The first one I suppose was the Crystal Palace exhibition in London, which was before the Civil War. Then here in the United States in 1876, we had had the, the, the National Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. That was the, the uh, moment at which the head of the Statue of Liberty was delivered to the United States. The statue itself was not complete, but that was the centerpiece. Then in 1893, Chicago held the Columbian Exposition. Then we have the Southern States Exposition in Atlanta. We have one in New Orleans. And in 1897, we had the Tennessee Centennial Exposition. Now, in 1893, Tennessee and the entire United States had suffered a tremendous depression. There'd been a stock market crash, a lot of people lost money, and it was a time of economic woes. And so one of the reasons for creating this e exhibition here in Centennial, what becomes known as Centennial Park, was to encourage people to start getting out again to take the trains, to come to Nashville, to see what Nashville had to offer. And the men who organized this did want to include women in this from the beginning. They worked very hard to make sure that women were not going to be left out of this. He wanted to show not only Tennessee's agricultural and industrial progress and improvements that we had made in those two fields. He also, Eugene Lewis, who was one of the leaders of this, wanted to show social improvement as well as economic, not just to improve the moral behavior of the masses, but he wanted to inspire and educate visitors. And indeed, the visitors did come. 
He also wanted the organizers to emphasize not just our state's natural resources, but also our human resources. And in this regard, he included three groups as of particularly uh, interest of, of particular interest to this exhibition. One were children. They were our future. This needed to make an impression on them. Then there were women and African Americans. And so indeed there were many activities for children here at the Centennial. Lots of educational opportunities here. We have the women's building and we have the Negro building, both representing progress and things that people can do. And so here we look at our history. You and I are sitting here looking backward at all of this and we're looking at the roles that people played here in Nashville in this time. These three parts of society really had a common history, but these three groups had been often neglected and had a tremendous amount of unfulfilled potential. And so in came the women. Now the Southern lady was a name that everybody was familiar with. What was a Southern lady to be? What was the proper form a, a Southern woman's behavior should be? It was an important source of regional time. And that really had begun well before the Civil War. But it was no, no simple task to have this representation of this idealized Southern woman. And yet this new feminism that is awakening around the United States, even in Tennessee in the 1898. And the word feminist was a word that a lot of people were really quite afraid of. Some feminists refused to repudiate traditional values and images of women's womanhood. And that really made the job of the women here at the Centennial much easier. They had special qualities, the women who organized all the female events here, they were morally refined, chast, they were chaste, they were temperate, they were pacifist, they argued shrewdly, they wanted their sphere to be expanded beyond the home into the public sphere. And this is what Mrs. Kirkman's statement was about. Yes, we do have a responsibility about the sphere of domesticity, but we also have a responsibility and an opportunity to take some steps out into the wider world. The first experience that women had with voluntary associations, which is what the Centennial Woman's Division was and what the Centennial Club will become, the first experience that women had in Tennessee and really the rest of the country for that matter was in religious and charitable organizations. Now by 1890, we had literary societies in all the major states of Tennessee. And these were largely the effects of urbanization, populations in cities growing rapidly, but even in county seat towns that were considerably smaller than Tennessee's four major cities, we had women volunteering to do things and they started these educational groups in their leisure time so that they could become more educated themselves. The primary goal initially of these groups was educational rather than charitable because charitable organizations had already been established. But you see women studying a lot of different kinds of things. Shakespeare, for instance. And you, you can imagine that here we've got some women sitting around in someone's lovely living room with Victorian furniture. They're talking about Shakespeare and they look out the window and there they see community needs everywhere. There's a need for libraries, there's a need for parks, school lunches, clean water, fresh milk, 
for poor children. We forget that before refrigeration, getting fresh milk was often a problem. And so these women began expanding that private sphere of domesticity and knowledge into the fulfillment of public needs and working towards that goal. Within these women's groups, you always saw cooperative spirit, mutual improvement, working together for a common cause. And yet they also looked after their families. Now, in 1894, when the organization of the Centennial Exposition actually officially began, Nashville and Tennessee had several socially prominent women's groups. They were all over the state. The first one had probably been Lizzie Crozier French's Sorosa, uh, Ossily Circle in Knoxville, which was founded in 1894. We had the 19th Century Club in Memphis, the Cosmos Club in Chattanooga, and in Nashville, we had women now working on the Centennial Commission, the Centennial Planning of the Women's Activities here. Now, there were several groups here in Nashville by this time, but they, they were smaller than these larger groups in Knoxville, Memphis, and Chattanooga. For example, one of the groups we had was the Quarry Club. <clears throat> Excuse me. It had been founded in 1896. Before the Centennial Exposition opened uh, by a woman who wanted to help single young women continue their education. They had a topic each time they met every week or two and they discuss things. For example, one of the programs was, how old is the new woman? By 1896 and seven, there was a lot of talk about this new woman. Of course, some people were quite afraid of the new woman. Uh, some were men, some were women. And then another topic that this group discussed was, what is her father's business? So here we've got the Quarry Club for Unmarried Women. It had been founded in 1885, and we had the Review Club, its counterpart, founded seven years later in 1892. It was really more or less the graduates of the Quarry Club that were married and wanted to continue this uh, group that they had founded. We had another group here in town, the Ladies Relief Society, which had been founded in 1889. It bought and founded what was known as the Old Woman's Home for Worthy Aged Women and Working Girls. They ran that establishment. But probably the group that really was the most influential just because of the women who founded it and were on the board was the Ladies Hermitage Association, founded in 1889 to preserve the hermitage. Historian Don Doyle said that its board provided a feminine mirror of the city's business leaders. Yes, these were elite women. In 1892, they honored Jackson's famous victory at the Battle of New Orleans with a lavish ball not in a hotel in Nashville, mind you, but at the Ponce de Leon Hotel in St. Augustine, Florida. Over a thousand invited guests were in attendance at that event. Nashvillians traveled to St. Augustine by privately chartered railroad car and what a party it was. And so from that point forward, January 8th every year was the event of the season, the social event, the Jackson Day Ball. It hell was held in various hotels in downtown Nashville. So here we've got the leadership of the LHA, Ladies Hermitage Association, taking the lead in the woman's building and the woman's committee of the Centennial Exposition. And I want you to keep in mind that Nashville had a strong population of African-American elite women. 
Nashville had a strong African-American middle class uh, so, uh, businesses here. We had business owners, we had doctors, we had professors, and they did very similar activities. In a few weeks, my colleague Linda Wynn is going to talk more about the African-American role in the Centennial and in, in Nashville society as well. So here we have this women's committee and they're going to pour their energies into this event, the centennial of the state. And I do want to clarify one thing here. Tennessee became a state in 1896. The planners of this began in 1894 and they didn't have quite enough time to get all of the buildings built and whatnot. So the centennial was celebrated in 1897, a year after the centennial. And I laughed about this today as I was thinking about what I was going to say tonight because that's pretty much what's happening with the suffrage celebrations. There's gonna be another big celebration here in Centennial Park in 2021 after we are not having to be so socially distant and wear masks, we hope, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. But let's talk about the women's building and what they did. I want you to imagine coming here to the centennial, arriving at this fair, you've taken the train, it is 1897, it opens on May the 1st uh, with great fanfare. You are here to see what it has to offer. Imagine walking through the gates at this white city and indeed it was magnificent to look at. So you are walking in, you are seeing all of these billion, bil uh, buildings, the industrial building, you have cotton growing in a cotton field, you've got a beautiful lake, we've got history and progress being mixed together here. We have the Memphis building, a pyramid. We have all manner of interesting things to look at and much to learn. And so here we're going to have this woman's building not only did women plan it, decide what they wanted in it, they hired a female architect to design this building. Sarah Ward Conley was a well-known artist here in town. She had not really exactly done a significant amount of architecture up to this point, but they wanted her to design this. And so they, work on the design of this building as you see how ornate it is with all the porticos and uh, detail around the top of the building. It was transformed into a show place. It was empty one day and then a week later you see all this feminine domestic uh, decoration appearing everywhere. Several different cities had their own rooms in there and decorated it. Imagine walking in to this building. Now this is the day that Mrs. McKinley, President McKinley's wife and the president himself came to the Centennial and you see this crowd outside of the woman's building as Mrs. McKinley is going in to the woman's building uh, for a group of women who will meet with her and undoubtedly uh, entertain her in some fashion there. Imagine seeing this building from the outside and then walking into this magnificent space. Isn't it beautiful? This was the two-story rot rotunda Look at the sweeping staircase and that floating balcony surrounding this sweeping staircase framed with the rose colored glass window up above and the design in that window represents the apotheosis of woman. Woman's groups from across the state and the nation flocked 
to see this building and all of its beautiful rooms. The Mount Vernon Association from Virginia came and had their own room in the woman's building, carefully selected wallpaper with stenciling furniture of the period of George and Martha Washington. Other rooms reflected the Victorian tastes of the day. Some had extensive collections of painted china. There were other examples of decorative art. And of course, there was a model kitchen equipped with the latest in domestic technology, along with practical demonstrations of science and modern cooking. As I was thinking about this this afternoon, I was also thinking about a picture that I have in my mind of Richard Nixon, who was vice president, taking a model American kitchen to the Soviet Union and showing it to Premier Nikita Khrushchev, the modern kitchen for an American woman in the 1950s. And I wondered how the kitchen at the woman's pavilion in 1897 compared with that modern kitchen that Vice President Nixon took to Russia. Now behind this of all things was a crude log cabin. And why did the women put a log cabin behind this magnificent house building? They wanted to show the striking contrast between the efficiency of modern domestic activity and the difficulty that pioneer women had when they were living in such very primitive situations. A one room cabin that was quite drafty and cooking and feeding children and taking care of the sick and lots of other things too. Now these women who planned this, they weren't just gonna open the doors and forget about it. What they were gonna do was, and they did very successfully, planned a series of programs more reflective of progressive era feminists than the domestic life. And so what they had were special days and they had lecturers who came and spoke at these very special days. Suffrage day, you can imagine what that was celebrating. It was celebrating working toward women getting the right to vote. Suffrage uh, uh, women came to Nashville to see this exhibit. They had speeches throughout the day about that. They had college days in which they had programs that were presented by women who had college degrees. More and more women every year were getting college educations and they wanted to showcase the fact that college could be a possibility for younger women. They wanted younger women to consider this. There was a conference held here of the State Federation of Women's Clubs. There was a Business Woman's Day, a Women's Press Day. There were all of these things and each and every one of those programs were stretching the boundaries of a traditional woman's domestic sphere in the home. And so they're really kind of very subtly giving this new feminist consciousness to Tennessee women. One of the people who spoke at the social science convocation was none other than Jane Addams, the social reformer, the founder of Hull House, a community center, a settlement house in Chicago, whereby she and a group of women on her board provided social, ser social services for immigrant families who came in and took factory jobs there. Jane Addams came to Nashville actually several times. Nashville ironically had a very active organization that has long been since forgotten called the Housekeepers Club. And what this was, the purpose of this club was to teach women how to be more efficient in their housekeeping so that they could go out and work on causes and not spend so much time in the kitchen working. And so the Housekeepers Club was progressive housekeeping and house management tips for women. Jane Addams came and spoke to that. She came in 1914 to the National Association of a Woman Suffrage 
uh, when it had its convention here in town. The National Council of Women met shortly before the exhibition closed in the fall at the social science, uh, at the, uh, uh, the National Council of Women spoke at their own meeting, they held their own meeting and they brought in to speak Susan B. Anthony herself. She spoke and talked about suffrage at this, at this uh, association's meeting, the National Council of Women. Anna Howard Shaw, a female minister who later becomes the president of the Suffrage Association, comes and speaks. And the National, Associ the National Association of Colored Women, founded by a Tennessee woman, Mary Church Terrell, Mary Church had been born and raised in Memphis. She attended college in Ohio, married Robert Church and lived in Washington, DC. She founded this organization for African-American women. They held their national convention here in town, not at the women's building because this was Jim Crow segregation and Nashville was very much a segregated city but they had their meetings at the Howard Congregational Church or the Negro Pavilion. They went back and forth. Kate Kirkman went and spoke to that organization at one of their meetings, and there was a lot of cordiality, but that very, very high wall of segregation still separated the races. And so very near the end of the exhibition, I think this was planned more or less to be a surprise, but they have Kate Kirkman Day. Now here is Kate Kirkman, and I really, really like this picture. Do you see this fox stole on her? This stole was in the trunk where the Fanukians found these dresses last year. Can you imagine these dresses that you see at this exhibition and that stole were in that trunk. Quite an amazing thing. But this was planned Kate Kirkman Day. And here I think probably this day as much as any showed all the contradictions that this new woman was having to deal with. First of all, they have a baby show in the morning. Baby shows were quite popular. Babies in carriages, decorated carriages. Then in the afternoon, they had a floral parade. Floral parades were also quite popular in Nashville in particular. There were lots of these floral parades. You decorate your cabin, your, not your cabin, excuse me. You decorate your cabbage, carriage, you decorate your carriage, you decorate your horses' harnesses, you decorate your man riding behind you with flowers, and people loved these parades. And then in the afternoon, after that parade took place, there was a reception in the evening and all the eyes were focused on Kate Kirkman and what she had been able to do. They were focusing on three great missions in a woman's life. The woman, the artist, and the bell. And Kate Corkman was reported as wearing that evening a white satin gown covered with dazzling gems and crowned by diamond stars. In this unlikely setting, one speaker talked about woman's work. Here at the exhibition, the woman's work has been as a writer, as an inventor, a scientist, a teacher, new wonders of her ability are unfolded here at this centennial exposition. And so it was that women came together, they accomplished a great deal, and what they accomplished gave them a tremendous amount of courage and enthusiasm and confidence for what else they could do. In 1905, the year after the Woman's Building Monument was dedicated, 
women who had participated in the Centennial formed the Centennial Club, Nashville's first civic organization interested in making this city a more beautiful, safer and healthier place to live. They worked towards those goals and women got the right to vote in 1920. Thanks to some of these women, Kate Birch Warner, who is featured in this exhibition, Anne Dallas Dudley, also featured, and Frankie Pierce. These three women really supported suffrage and they worked very hard to see that Tennessee got that amendment ratified, the 36th in deciding state. I must tell you, that Kate, Kirk, Kate Kirkman was opposed to women voting. She thought that women were more powerful without the vote than they would be with the vote. She did not support woman suffrage. And the women who were the leaders of Nashville's groups were pretty well evenly divided about woman suffrage. About half of them said they really thought it was a good idea and the other half said, we don't need it. We are more powerful without the vote. And so, as Alan McGuire designed the Athena inside the Parthenon, he also designed this magnificent monument to the women of 1920, who worked tirelessly as the women of the Centennial Organization here at the Centennial Exhibition had worked to make the woman's building and the women's activities so successful. These women had a, a calling they felt, they had a job to do, and they were singly minded until they achieved it. They worked so that all of us can have the rights that we have today, and it really did begin right here with the Centennial Woman's Committee. Now, I think we've got some time for a few questions and a few uh, 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 comments, perhaps. Anybody have a question here? Am I off share screen? Yes. All right, I see, I see that Alma Sanford and Jean Wilson, who are two of the women who had a great deal to do with that suffrage statue out there, are, are, are watching tonight. I'm glad to hear from you all. Glad to see you there. Uh, you all did a great job, and I hope I did justice to the parachuters when I talked about them, because I'm still talking about the parachuters. And uh, someone is writing here that perhaps we need to put a statue up of Susan B. Anthony. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of women that need statues. We've got a lot of statues of men. I think we should go for monument equality next uh, and see how long it would take for us to get uh, statues here, there, and yon. All right, now I see a question from Melissa Davis. What was the rationale for not thinking voting would provide women with power? Now, I will, I will preface this with a little bit of a personal story. When I got married in 1974, a friend of mine who had gotten married the year before gave me a book. And she, well, she actually, she gave me two books. One was called The Total Woman and the other was called Fascinating Womanhood. But what she told me was whatever I did not to let my husband see these books. Now, what is in the, these books, The Total Woman and Fascinating Womanhood? Well, it's all about how you manipulate men by making them think they are strong and powerful when you are behind the scenes telling them what to do. So for example, your husband comes home from work and you've got your apron on and your pearls and your high heel shoes preparing a lovely dinner as June Cleaver would have done. And uh, 
you say to your husband, oh, honey, I am just so tired. I've just worked so hard today. Could you please carry this big, heavy sack of garbage out? And I, I would thought the whole thing was pretty hysterical myself. This was 1974, not 1914. And that was what it was all about. I mean, I think these women figured they could manipulate the men better if they were more, um, not even coy, I would say the word was deception. And so it, that idea is still around, I think, not so much as it was in 1974, but it's still around today. Anybody have any other questions here? I've got two wonderful technical people and I am so honored to be here in Centennial Park behind, uh, in front of all of this grandeur here. I hope every one of you will put it on your bucket list to come over here very soon and see this exhibit. And if you haven't had your picture taken out there in front of the suffrage monument, it is time for you to come and have your picture made. Bring your grandchildren, bring those grandsons, as well as your granddaughters. Come over here, walk around the nature trail they've got. It's really quite spectacular. And in addition to seeing this exhibit with these dresses of Kate Kirkman's here, you have to go upstairs and say hi to Athena. She never, ever fails to take my breath away. I bring my granddaughters over here when they're here and we uh, really enjoy having our pictures taken. We take pictures of each other in front of the Athena that they can take back to Sweden with them where they live. Now, here is a question from Candy and I'm not sure that I know the answer as of today. The question is, is the fence around down around the statue? And the answer is no. So you better wait a little while. When do we expect the fence to? A month or two soon. Maybe a month or two, but pretty soon. It's really improving. Every time I come over here, and I've been over here several times, uh, it really, really uh, keeps looking more and more finished. So yes, you've got to come over here after the fence comes down. You don't want a fence around the statue when you take your picture. But come over here and see this exhibit anyway. We've got two questions here. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any further architectural work from Sarah Ward Conley? I do not. She has some artwork, paintings and whatnot, but I know of no other building that she designed. That should be a fairly easy question to answer. Uh, there's a good bit of information down in the Nashville room when the public library opens again. In the meantime, if you make an appointment, you can go to the Tennessee State Library and Archives. The staff of both the Nashville Public Library and the Tennessee State Archives the Nashville Public Library has the Nashville Room and the Nashville Archives in the building, and the Tennessee State Library and Archives is right beside the state capitol. If you make an appointment at the archives, it is open, and one of the research assistants there in the reference department should be able to help you answer that question. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate you coming and watching this tonight. I hope I'll see you again. Bye-bye. One more thing. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We are honored and thrilled that you were able to join us for our very first virtual symposium. We have to thank Humanities Tennessee. We are so grateful for their support for this virtual symposium and for the one coming up on Thursday, October 29th. We had a question in the Q&A from Marty that will be at 6 p.m. on October 29th and it's called Philosophically Bound Together, African American and White Women and the Right of the Franchise. So we hope you can join us again um, in late October. 
Um, we also would like to thank Centennial Park Conservancy for organizing all the behind the scenes work for this Zoom um, symposium. And of course, Metro Parks for their support. We will be sending out an evaluation. We would love to hear your thoughts about this um, Parthenon Symposium. So we hope you will, will take some time for a short and pain-free evaluation in the coming week. Um, we also would like to mention that if you visit our website, which is nashvilleparthenon.com, you can see a digital version of our We Have a Vision exhibit. Uh, we will be having the free registration for the October symposium up by this by the end of this week. If you're interested, you can register for free online. And I would also like to mention we have a suffrage photo hunt. We have a map of Centennial Park and you can go visit some of the sites and, um, and places that Dr. Busey mentioned in the symposium tonight in person. And you can share your photos with us on Instagram and be entered to win a prize after you march the park, just like the suffragists did about a hundred years ago. So thank you very much to Dr. Carol Busey. We really enjoyed hearing all of her expertise this evening and thank you for joining us. We hope you have a great evening.